Welcome to the Alengi Yacht Podcast, a podcast about life, leadership, and money matters. Our guest today is Farah Stockman. Farah is a member of the New York Times editorial board. She has written about foreign and national affairs. She's also interested in politics, race, and social movements across the United States. She started her career as a journalist in Kenya, where she used to work with street children. She's a Pulitzer Prize winner, and today we will speak about her book, American Made, What Happens to People When Work Disappears. Farah, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me on. So Farah, I wonder if we could go a little bit into your background. Uh, I just already mentioned that you work in Kenya helping with street children. So uh, take us there. Why, why do you feel they need to go to Kenya? Uh, so when I graduated from college, I, uh, I really wanted to see the world. I had spent four years at Harvard and, uh, you know, listening to lectures about the world, and I really was hungry to see it. So I got a fellowship to move to a small town in Kenya called Machakos, and I spent two years teaching Uh, kids who were very economically vulnerable. Um, they came to my classroom barefoot and uh, really wanted to learn. And it was an amazing experience. And um, so I spent, you know, the next 20 years actually um, on a organization that sent street children to schools to become mechanics and hairdressers and seamstresses. And so I, I really spent a lot of time thinking about the livelihoods of, of vulnerable kids in Africa. And I paid no attention to the livelihoods that were disappearing in my own backyard here in the United States. And what is it that attracted you towards journalism? Well, I've always been really interested in writing and wasn't sure I could make a living at it. And when I was in Kenya, I decided to give it a try. Nairobi was an amazing place to become a journalist because that's where that was a hub for all of the national newspapers. And you could um, live in Nairobi, a very, a very nice life, and cover 11 countries surrounding it, nine of which were at war. And so um, one day I just looked in the yellow pages and looked up the New York Times literally in the, in the yellow pages at, at a phone booth and called the New York Times office and said, can I be your intern? And the, the correspondent at the time said, well, we don't really have an internship program and I, don't, I can't really pay you, but I'll take you out to lunch. And so I I went out to lunch uh, with him and ended up um, he kind of basically being like the coffee girl. I, I would I, I got a key to the office. They would let me in. I, and what what I what I got out of it was the ability to use the phone and the ability to read the New York Times, which were very it was very expensive to read American newspapers at that time uh, in in Kenya. And so I, I sort of spent months just kind of hanging around and not really making a living. I was hungry. I was starving. I won't say starving, but I was I was uh, living off of probably $15 a week. And I was hanging out with these really rich journalists who would take me out to drinks and they wouldn't they wouldn't they would want to split the bill at the end of the night. And they didn't even realize how poor I was, how broke I was at the moment. They'd be oh, fair. Just give us the thousand shillings, which was like, I don't know, 15 bucks at the time. And they thought, oh, you know, they were cutting me a break and you know, I would have ordered the, the cheapest thing on the menu, the smallest thing on the menu. And that would be my, you know, I'd, I'd hand over my money and that would be my food budget for the whole week. So I was going to give up and go to graduate school and I'd actually applied to graduate school. And then in 1998, the embassy was bombed. The, there was the twin bombings. It was the first big Al Qaeda attack on the United States. They bombed the embassy in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. And all of a sudden, the New York Times starts paying me $100 a day. And it felt like a million bucks. And they would they set up this huge investigative team. It was the biggest story in the world. And had it not been for that bombing, I'm not sure I would be a journalist today. But I they basically, every morning, I would go into the office and they would throw a 
a newspaper on the the local newspaper on the desk and it would have like a front page story about someone who'd been arrested and they'd say go find that guy who is he tell us who he is and i you know all of a sudden all the things i learned teaching street kids in the slums came back and and helped me because then i could get on a bus i could find people um there was a guy who was a guard at the embassy who had been um, really the one who saved the American embassy. And he stood in front of a truck and the truck exploded in front of him. Miraculously, he survived, but he was blinded. And he did one interview with a television station and then he disappeared, no one could find him. And that was my job, find that guy. And I went begging to his boss uh, who was a black American. And I used, I played the black American card. I was like, help a sister out. This is my, <laughs> I need to, I need a break here. Tell me where he lives. And the guy just laughed and he said, Madare, which is a slum of like, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people and there are no addresses. And that's all I needed. I was like, okay. Wow. And I know how to, I know how to work a slum. I went there on the bus. I looked at all the clotheslines. I looked for the uniforms of the security guard company hanging on the clotheslines. And I would ask people, do you know who works there? Do you, do you know this guy, this guy, this guy? And finally, by the end of eight hours, I had that guy. Wow. So that's how I became a journalist. <laughs> you know, uh, part of my morning routine, I, of course, I fix my coffee and then I open my news. I read the local news first and then I go to the New York, uh, New York Times. And that's, I, I, you know, that's part of, as a podcaster, I like to be aware of what's going on. And I use the New York Times as my source of information for, for that. So well, uh, thanks for being a reader. We appreciate it. OK, so uh, in, at the beginning of the book, also, you let us know that you are a mixed race child. You one, par one of your parents is white, the other one is black. I want and you write about race. I wonder if you could share with us some privilege and some instances of discrimination that you have suffer in doing living that dual life i mean to me it's been an amazing experience to be able to see things from both sides and um you know my mother grew up in jim crow mississippi she um had you know she wasn't allowed she did not she went to segregated schools um, she wasn't even allowed to go to the library when she was a kid and based on a lifetime of, you know, or very rough early childhood memories. Um, but, and my father grew up in Pennsylvania, not a rich family, um, but um, it, you know, he sees the best in people. He gives people the benefit of the doubt. And so I, I recount in the book how I remember, you know, if, if a waitress treated our family badly, my mother would just assume that waitress doesn't um, agree with interracial marriage. And because she's, that has been her experience. Mm. And my father would just, oh, she's tired. Yeah. She's, she's been on her feet all day. And so it, it was amazing how two incredibly intelligent people who, who love each other, they're still married, they've been married more than 50 years, um, can see the same thing uh, in a very different way based on their, their history and what they know the world to be. And so that I, that's kind of why I became a journalist is to interview the waitress and right. figure out what, what's, what's, uh, what's really behind that, who, which one of my parents is right. Wow. Uh, okay, so there you are, you're writing all these uh, stories for the New York Times. And uh, what is it that told you that now you have to write this book, American Made? Well, so after Trump was elected, I like a lot of Americans, a lot of college educated Americans um, in the East Coast, I was, I was wondering what caused so many of my fellow citizens to vote for this man who had never served even a single day in government. How could a person like that be elected president and particularly by diehard union men and women who have been Democrats. Historically, the Democratic Party was the working class party, but what you saw in 2016 is it kind of flipped. Whereas if you were college educated, you were much more likely to vote for Hillary Clinton. She won the college educated vote. Um, 
and but the working class voted for Trump and they put him in office. I mean, I think if it weren't for the working class, Jeb Bush might have been the, the nominee for for um, the Republican Party. And so, you know, why had so many working class people voted for um, Republicans, which used a party that used to stand for the corporations? And so I I started looking into this and I, I was looking at my sister's Facebook page and my sister is an engineer who, um, who designs machines that replace human beings. And yet she really feels empathy for the people who are being replaced. And she says, well, this is the only way this American factory can stay here is if we automate. And, but don't, you know, it was annoying her that so many people in the wake of Trump's election were saying, the factories are never coming back, just get over it, just deal with it. And she's saying, that's not empathy. And if you want people to vote for you, you have to have a little bit of empathy, even if it's true that they're not coming back, even if it's true that, you know, this is not the future of the economy, just telling such a large group of people that they don't have a future in the economy. It's, it's, um, it's not a, it, it's not a winning formula. And it's, and it's, 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 it's um, alienating a lot of people. So I started, I decided at that point, I would follow a factory that was closing down to really see what that's like. What does it feel like to have your boss tell you, oh, these people over here are willing to do your job cheaper. And so you're gonna have to train them and then you're gonna be jobless. What does that feel like? What, what do you go through? What do, your, what do your coworkers go through? And so I looked at which factories um, were closing down at that point. And I chose Rexnord in Indianapolis because Trump had tweeted about this factory. And one single tweet, had given these workers hope that maybe their jobs will be saved. And they spent hours talking about this one tweet. And you know the fact that he had tweeted about them made them feel that this man cared about them personally. And it was, uh, you know, so I, I followed um, Shannon Mulcahy. She's a white woman and steel worker at this bearing plant. I followed her for seven months while her factory shut down, while she agonized over whether to train her Mexican replacement, she, she ended up agreeing to do it and really feeling a bond with him. You feel it, you know, there's a point where he apologizes to her. He's a young kid, he's the age of her son. And, and he takes her aside and says like, I'm so sorry, I didn't know. Uh, a lot of the Mexican replacements were sent up and they weren't exactly told what was going on and but they faced so much hostility for the from the American workers and figured out <laughs> what was going on but so he apologizes and she said like you know I've been blessed with this job for a long time and now it's your turn to be blessed and so I learned I learned uh I got into Shannon's life I wrote her story in November or in the fall of 2017 and a lot of readers wrote me and said please um please tell us what happens to her. Wow. So I decided to keep following her. And I also followed Wally, a black guy who was um, one of the most popular uh, workers. Everybody loved Wally. And Wally was one of the most optimistic workers, even though he, as a black man, had a, had a you know, statistically would have had a much harder time getting a new job. Um, he was a believer in the American dream. And he was the, you know, he said, you know what, I'm going to start my own business. I've always wanted to start a barbecue business, love barbecue. And this is my chance. And I think God has closed this factory to give me my chance to live out my dream. Compare that to a lot of the white guys, especially the diehard union guys. So I also followed the, the vice president of the union, a white guy, and they were beside themselves with grief over the closing of the plant. And they were, you know, that was the only identity they had ever known. Some of them one, you know, a lot of them, their fathers had worked there, their grandfathers had worked there. They'd worked there since they were coming out of high school. And so um, for them, they, you know, for the white, for a lot of the, I won't say all, but for the diehard union white guys, this was the end. You know, this was a sign that, um, 
that our country was going in the wrong direction, that college educated people were selling them out, that the Democratic Party had had sold out the working class. And they believed, you know, about half of them voted for Trump, I would say. And they, they, they endorsed Bernie Sanders at first. But when Bernie Sanders lost, they endorsed Trump because Bill Clinton had signed NAFTA and they were not going to vote for Bill Clinton's wife. And like, so all of this was very eye opening to me because I had, you know, to me in my mind, NAFTA was all a positive, Every, you know, globalization was all positive. Everybody in my world and my college educated world had been made richer by globalization, ha, you know, every job I'd ever had was about the interconnectedness of the world. You know, as a journalist writing about foreign policy, as a, you know, so many of my friends live abroad. They, uh, you know, I've gone to weddings and, and, and birthday parties and, you know, the, the interconnectedness of the world was a boon to me. And this was the first time I really started interacting deeply on a daily basis with people who, who saw globalization in a very different way and just as loss. So I, it was a really eye-opening experience for me. Wow. Okay. I guess this is where the huge difference between macroeconomics and microeconomics come to life because from the outside perspective, from the macroeconomic perspective, we can see all oh, this is benefit, a great benefit to society. Sure. More and more people are getting out of poverty. Sure. There are more and more jobs. The standard sure. of living is going up, blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, you highlight three different people who they themselves have been misplaced, have lost their job, and they don't know what to do with their life. I wonder, um, I wonder what can you say about the big picture in a way that, you know, like at the end, the, you know, I, I, even before, before um, Donald Trump, we were having, what is it, a, a record low unemployment. Uh, and now, sure, there are hundreds and hundreds of people looking for jobs, but at the same time, there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, businesses looking for employees <laughs> to start. Right, right, right. So, right. so no, there's always a mismatch. Yeah, well, yes. So let, let me take that in two parts. First, just before COVID, before we get into COVID and, and the situation the country's in right now, I want to say that if you look at Donald Trump, he's a global, he's the symptom of something globally that's happening right? We had Brexit. You have, you have the rise of authoritarian and far-right and nationalist leaders all over the world. It's not just the United States, right? You're seeing, you know, from Brazil to, to Britain, you, you're seeing people, uh, even in India, if you look at Modi, like there's something happening that is making people turn away from globalization, turn away from increasing interconnectedness and saying, we don't actually want uh, rules that are made by people in a faraway capital to impact us. And I think, you know, that comes from somewhere. It, come, it comes from this feeling like my reality isn't actually being represented by the people in, in Washington or by the people, I guess, in Europe, they would say Brussels or wherever, wherever they feel. And I, I think globalization is really a part of that story um, because, and it's not, even though the economic pie grew in the United States with these trade agreements and with, with, with increasing globalization, the total wealth grew, but the pie became more unequal. Mm -hmm. and, and classic economic theory talks about that. It, it does, but we forgot that part. In the 90s, there was a lot of euphoria around trade and what it could do for people and that it would be a win-win. And they, they, under, they oversold the benefits and undersold the downsides. And if you look at the downsides, they tend to pile on the shoulders of the least educated. In, the, in, in, a, in an industrialized economy like the United States, we've always known who the winners were, were gonna be. Okay, everybody wins when you get cheaper goods. That's true. But, you know, the people who are selling this stuff are never the people whose jobs get washed away, right? 
Um, so that to me, I think if you if you're somebody sitting in a Rust Belt town that lost its industry because of cheap imports from China or because of uh, you know a factory moved moved to Mexico, and you're you're um, you're watching the news and hearing economists and politicians say this is a win win. It's going to make us stronger. But that's not your experience. Mm. And that's not the experience of anyone you know. Then you're just going to stop listening to them. And a lot of them didn't even vote. They stopped voting. They were, they thought all politicians were crooks. They kind of disengaged from politics itself to the extent. And, and, and Trump really spoke to them. I mean, he didn't. He didn't invent those points. Those people were out there. Every newsletter of the steel workers was about the, you know, all the downsides of NAFTA and all the, all the, um, the way it was a, a betrayal of them. And so I think in the United States, we just didn't do a good enough job of taking care of those workers. We didn't train them to, to compete in a global economy. We didn't, we didn't um, give them uh, and by the way, I went down to Monterey, Mexico, where the where the factory moved to, and talked to a lot of the Mexicans who were working in the new plant. And they had a lot of technical experience. They had a lot of technical education in high school, and in many ways were more poised to to participate in the global economy than than the American workers. But but um, you know, here here we are, the American dream was what? It was having a good union job that with, with high pay, earning $25 an hour with a high school degree and healthcare and benefits and all of those things that make life, make it kind of expensive to run a factory, right? So the, the jobs that went overseas, they were not the crappy jobs. They were right. the good jobs right. that you right. could get. They were, the, they were the best blue collar jobs. Those jobs were like family heirlooms that were passed from father to son. And so when you take those jobs away and you tell people it's never coming back, you know, what does that mean to them? How, how, how are you gonna get them on board by saying, oh, but I got rich over here on my stock portfolio. Mm. Okay, uh, I live in, uh, in Quebec, Canada, not too far away from you. And yeah. here the government, uh, for people who has been mis uh, displaced because of yeah. different working yeah. condition, the government pays them to go back to school, give them a salary, $2,500 yeah. per month, plus, wow. all, plus the university expenses in order for them to learn the new whatever skill right now is tech technological skills or you name it from uh, I, I, over a hundred different universities and Canada is a smaller, poorer country than the, than the sure. United States. Uh, sure. Is there anything similar like that going on in the United States? So we have something called trade adjustment assistance. It's a program. It's, it, it's, it's very, um, it's, it's not as good. And it's, it's, it hasn't worked well. Mm. Um, you can see uh, there was a study about what happened to the people who used it. Not a lot of people use it, but they got paid less than those. It, they were earning less after using that program than, um, than their counterparts who just got unemployment insurance. And so we haven't done a good job in the United States with supporting workers who are displaced and making sure that they get on another track. And part of the reason, I mean, these are blue collar workers for the last 30 years have right. seen their income stagnate. So we're moving to a service economy. Our manufacturing is gone. I, I, I won't say it's gone, but the, the, the factories you're seeing come up are highly automated. So they're not really, um, they don't employ as many people. And we just haven't done as, as good a job as Europe or Canada at transitioning people into a new life. But there's this idea in the United States, well, it's capitalism, you know, go out there and make your living. But that's not what created the American middle class. It's not. American middle class was created on the backs of those factories and a labor movement that made sure people got a living wage. And as soon as it succeeded for, for blacks and for women, 
as soon as blacks and women started getting in those factories in the 60s and 70s, those factories started moving. So, you know, it, it's really a cauldron of, of uh, tension because now you have a growing number of people fighting over a shrinking number of good blue collar jobs. And that's where the, that's where the racism comes in. That's where the, the competition between groups of people come in because they're fighting for a smaller number of good paying blue collar jobs. Okay, well, I hate to ask this question, but I think I have to ask it. What's the future? I mean, is the new government going to do anything? And I hear all these ideas about making college education free and uh, a, yeah. a big package here and there. If you had to guess, what would be the direction that the country will take? Oh, my goodness. Well, I do think the Biden administration understands that blue collar people did not feel well served by the by this i by by this idea that we can have free trade and globalization but not care take care of our own workers i think i do think that biden is trying to pass an infrastructure package that will bring blue, blue collar workers a lot of jobs i think people are starting to in, think about ways that we can invest in our country and bring bring some of those jobs back. Um, how we're gonna design a globalization that works for average ordinary people and not just multinational companies that exploit and you know, use workers. That's, I think to me, the big challenge before us and it's a global challenge. It's not just the United States that is dealing with this yes. problem. Everywhere. And so, you know, many of our biggest challenges are global challenges, pandemic, climate change, and migration of people. And so many people are migrating because of economic circumstances. So these are big things that we can only solve together. But I think for a long time, the, the rules of the global economic system were written by companies. And they, you know, they were not written for their workers, they were written for the for the shareholders yes. and the CEOs. All right. Well, in your book, uh, one of your characters asked this question that I'm going to ask of you and I'm going to ask of everyone in the audience. If you could do anything, what would you do? Well, yeah, so that was John, who was the uh, white worker, the, the union vice president that I followed. And he was trying, that was the time he was trying to figure out what was he going to do after the factory. And he actually had a he had a job where he was a job offered to become a steel worker again. And that was like a big part of his identity was a, being a steel worker and a union rep. And he just, you know, he agonized because he was like, how long is this factory going to be here? He went through, this was the second plant closing he'd survived. He'd lived through. So he was not willing to try again. Um, and so he asked me, what would you do if you could do anything and money didn't matter? And I had to tell him the truth, which was, I'd be a journalist interviewing you, right? So I am lucky. I'm one of the lucky ones. I do, I'm doing something I absolutely love. I feel lucky every day to be a writer, to tell people stories. It's an amazing experience. And yet so many people get up every day and do a job that they don't like, or that that hurts their back or hurts their hands, or, you know, and they're just working for retirement. And so you know that's one of the big inequalities we have in our society and um do you think in a way i like uh, let's say uh, a teenager ends up working i don't know in a fast food place it's not a job that he or she would like but that in a way is, is part of the stages of life uh, and i feel like so sometimes people get stuck in those yeah, stages sure. in life like a, sure. uh let's say you are cashier at walmart and if you are there because you are 20 and that's your first job i mean there's nothing wrong with that but if you have been 15 years in the same post then uh true true i will say though that i think one of my big takeaway from this experience is that there is inherent dignity in work there's so many things that people get out of their jobs besides just a paycheck. You get a community, you get coworkers to talk to, you get um, 
you get um, a feeling like you're a part of the economy. There were so many things that people got. Shannon, the, the, the woman I followed, um, she was able to leave an abusive man because she had a job at a factory and she got a lot of, it wasn't just the money, it was the self-confidence she got from earning a paycheck and not depending on someone else. And so I do think that there's a tendency to say, oh, well, just give them money, like just give them a, a government check. And there's the sense that, okay, in the future, all these jobs are gonna be done by machines. So we're just gonna have to move to universal basic income and a check will come in the mail. And I think there's, I think you can overstate the benefits of that. Yes, it's important to support people, but people get pride and, and they get, it gives you a reason to get out of bed every morning. And just to bring it back to COVID, we lost 90,000 people to opioid overdose in 2020. That's a 30% increase. You know, social science tells us that there is a mental health link. If you are, you know, it, during COVID, people who lost their jobs experienced high rates of, of, of depression, of anxiety. And if you compare them to those who only had their hours cut, people who only who had their hours cut in half were just fine. <laughs> Like they were they you know, they were, they were, they were not like the ones who lost their job. So, so we know, we know that there is a mental health link with work. We know that work has a positive benefit on so many levels, marriage rates of men, um, just a lot of levels. And so we can't leave that on the table. We can't walk away from that and say, you actually don't fit into the economy anymore. So we're just going to pay you and you're going to live your life on welfare. For the working class, work is defining, mm. right? What is the working class without work? So I, I do think that we have to, we have to give people the dignity of work in some way, even if we, if we have to end up supporting that work as a society in, in, with, with new measures. Well, Farah, I have so many more questions, but I know you have a wedding to go back to. So uh, <laughs> my last question is, could you tell us one more time the title of the book and where can the listeners follow the work that you do? Yes, um, my book is called American Made, What Happens to People When Work Disappears. And uh, you can follow me at farahstockman.com. That's a website. And my book tour is just getting started. This is my first a uh, podcast interview before the book tour. So thank you for having me on. Wow, I'm so privileged. Well, thank you for your time and good luck with, with the progress of your book. Thank you, thank you.